before I start, there's one word I want to teach uh, everybody. Uh, that's not a common word in, in our language, and it's epistemology. And um, it's funny, I started telling Megan to, what this word meant when she was three, because I wanted her to know. <laughs> so, so, so she, she recently had it in a class and she got it right. So um, epistemology is the study of how you know things, okay? So, and if you do, in fact, know, you know, for sure something, so that the, both things, but basically it's how do you know things. Now, intuition obviously falls under that rubric because, and so does perception. That's one way we know things, and the logic is another way. We have various reading books is another way. We, so we have, that's called testimony. So there's various kinds, but, it, but it's important we learn this word now because we're going to talk more about it next week and it's going to be real important. And I feel it's good to have a week to let it gel in your head what epistemology is. Okay, this uh, talk is called Baba in the Future and it's about materialism. It's about in the 20th century. Um, and I will repeat what I said at the very end of last, last week, um, which was um, people were trying to overcome the problems that were seen as an intractable of Rene Descartes' substance dualism. So substance dualism. Okay. And that was that there's two substances, one like spirit substance, which includes thought and mind and your soul and God even, the spirit substance. Okay. And then um, that would be over here. And that's where we, I put our, like, our mental trees over here. And our mind is over here. But you can kind of think of that bubble as your mind. And then over here was uh, the real tree, supposedly, which was theoretical, which makes sense if you've seen uh, the, the videos from the past. And then the first attempt we covered last week, which we're going to finish up on just a little bit, and it's called idealism. And it's the idea that um, we're going to emphasize mind over matter, okay? So in that one, last week, I said they got rid of this one and they tried to work with just mind. And then this week, as I said, at the end of last week, I mean, at the end of last week, I said they're going to try um, oh, matter. Yeah. So this week, they're going to try the opposite thing. They're going to try to get rid of mind. Now, the reason they're doing this is they're trying to get rid of the dualism part because there was an interaction problem, as I explained, uh, which you can go back to two talks ago. I explained the interaction problem of Cartesian dualism. And uh, so they're looking for a monism. Okay. Now, last week we covered the first um, way to resolve idealism. This week it'll be the materialism. We will see that neither works, and this uh, marks the exhaustion of the methods to resolve this problem using our current way of thinking. And then uh, this will complete this history, this, this talk will complete the history of thinking about how we perceive and things like that, and the soul and stuff. And next week we will begin to discuss the new way of thinking, but we're going get, to get start into that gingerly. Now, I, um, this talk, le the last talk went very smoothly, even though I had a lot to cover, because it had a kind of a structure. Um, one thinker would follow up on the thinking of the previous thinker. So it really told a story. That's the enlightenment of the 1600s and 1700s. But at the end of the, um, but this one is not like that. It's more like many unconnected attempts to achieve a single program, which is to find some way to make materialism work without mind, get rid of mind, um, and to make a monism, which is a respectable thing to do. And that's its only current theme. Um, materialism, in the most general way, is the absence of mind talk. Okay? Sometimes just don't talk. Just, okay, I won't get into that. I don't like to get into anything that'll slow us down. The idea of materialism was always a non-starter. That's my opinion. But we should not ridicule this last Western effort to unify Descartes' substance dualism into a monism. Um, but this is the quote I mentioned that I was going to refer to by Baba. Taking the most important words, 
All these philosophical explanations are confessed, though inspiring failures. Nonetheless, each such failure is a partial contribution to the knowledge of the beyond. Okay, so we're, it's just, uh, not, nobody's completely wrong. Okay, so interesting. Um, let me make sure this doesn't cut the butt. Oh, very good. All right. Materialism is not a theory. Most of the people think it, it's a theory. Um, the definitions right here and the, um, the definition of materialism from Encarta Dictionary, which I like, it's a, it's a physical dictionary. It's one of the last physical dictionaries that they, that they did. That was, it's, very, it's a very unabridged, great dictionary. Um, materialism, the theory, it's not really theory, you'll see. The theory that physical matter is the only reality and that psychological states will eventually be explained as physical functions. So it's a theory that one day will have a theory. Okay? But it states what its objective is. So in light, and it's basically, a, it's programmatic. It has a program. It, does, it hasn't really found a way to succeed at its program. But it remains forever optimistic. Which in the previous quote, Baba said, you know, that that's the, 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 the grace of it, the failures. Um, it's, um, instead of being disheartened by confessed failures, others are inspired to make fresh attempts, you know. And uh, Baba does not ridicule that. Um, they, they actually openly say that if they believe that they'll have a theory, maybe in a hundred years. Okay. They state the conclusion they wish to reach, no mind, but never quite find an explanation that makes that make sense. Now, at the end of last talk, we finished with Kant, Immanuel Kant, and I explained his idealism with the lenses, the glasses. And um, I want to say what happened between there and the 20th century, because he, he's the end of the Enlightenment, which is the end of the 1700s, and you have the 1800s in the middle. So what happened in the 1800s? Well, what happened in the 1800s is you had a whole bunch of up Germans warmed up to Kant, to Kant's idea. Um, basically, they adopted um, certain fundamental principles that he had said, such as time does not exist, okay, um, and space does not exist, and cer certain things. And they still continue to accept those in uh, existentialism, which is called uh, part of continental philosophy, which is a different, it's a different stream. Um, in the, um, I'll explain that later. Now, what happened, you had these, um, all these idealists. Each one had another name for his idealism. They, they called it objective idealism, and they called it um, subjective idealism, and they had different names. And then Hegel's was absolute idealism, and if you remember, Kant's was called transcendental idealism. So everybody had an idealism, and they wanted to brand it with you know, his name. And, um, but what happened in this is that, remember the, the thing in itself? And I said that there can't really be a separation. They can't really have a dualism because Kant said anything that would make a dualism would be in your mind. So he, he self, in the last talk, that's clear at, toward the end. But well, they saw that. And so they said, well, well let's just say it's just, just all mind. So what happened is they meant by mind the individual human intellect. Okay, human reason. And human reason became God. It didn't become God um, like we know God. It, it wasn't, a, it, but it's like a substitute, uh, which is funny because reason becomes God. There's actually a, a thing in history of the French Revolution where, uh, I won't say that. Well, I got, they, they made a paper mache uh, throne at the top of the stairs, and then uh, uh, Pierre, who's the, the Pierre of, of the French Revolution? Uh, he actually walked, it was, they called it the, the throne of reason, and he actually traversed the stairs in a ceremony and sat in the chair of reason. But they were kind of going crazy. A bit. Uh, the other thing is they hypostatized being, because that's all that they kind of seemed to be, um, because it wasn't a stuff, there wasn't a substance. So um, this uh, hypostatizing or making being into a thing, that created a lot of problems in language, because you're using it as a kind of a, uh, part of a predicate, so you know it's like is is you know it it, it doesn't it, it ends up being confusing. So what happened is this eventually made its way over to England in the 
18, 1800s. And it became call, uh, called British idealism or absolute idealism, and they took it from Hegel. And they were doing the same kind of stuff, and this was the trend of the 1800s. The 1800s was all idealist. Um, the most famous British idealist was F.H. Haight Bradley. This is a quote by Bradley, and it gives a kind of um, what, what would have, they would eventually, in England, at Cambridge, they would rebel against this kind of writing, which was very hard to understand, and even the people who wrote, even Bradley admitted he couldn't make sense of what he was saying. This last book is called Appearance and Reality. By the way, they, they know about Hinduism by this time. The Hindu uh, Vedas have been translated in the early 1800s into English, by the English. And so all these people were aware of Maya and all this. So it's not like they just didn't know. They, they were trying to make that work, okay? But this is the kind of language they had. So it has, this is a quote by Bradley, it has the feature of immediacy and self-dependence for the terms are given to it and not constituted by it. It possesses, again, the character of plurality, and as representing the primitive felt whole, it has once more the character of a comprehending unity, a, a, a unity, however, not constituted by the differences, but added from without, and even against its will, the further, I, I won't go on. It was just, uh, no, nobody, I don't know anybody who is a Bradley fan. Then, uh, so just because you sound deep doesn't mean you're making sense. They really tried, and it was a very good honest try, but by, uh, by the time of Bertrand Russell was starting out and uh, teaching at Cambridge, that was the thing. That's what, and Bertrand Russell had to write like that, but he hated it. He was very angry. Then, in 1903, right at the beginning of the turn of the century, these two men rebelled. There was a, they, they began a revolt. And this revolt continues to this moment in the, in the, uh, the West, um, not including those who continue on with uh, uh, existentialism. When you talk about Camus or Sartre, you're talking about continental philosophy, which doesn't react, not only is not my area of expertise, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about, uh, the my body problem, for instance. They're not talking about technicalities. It's more poetic. You may find that it can bring inspiration to you. Uh, it's good reading. They may find truth in it, but it's not, it hasn't, it's, it's not part of our narrative. It's, it doesn't talk about this kind of technical thing. They were not technical. They were more poetic. Now, they, they reacted against the kind of the language um, that, of the British idealists, and that it didn't make it seem to them to make any sense, even though Russell had even gotten no, like, uh, accolades for his own imitation of it. So he was quite sure it was like uh, pretending. Uh, you know. So. Now, um, so <clears throat> now they rebelled, not just against them. They kind of had forgotten what came before because they, they as school boys, they were they got mad then, and so they, they kind of ended up get rejecting the whole enlightenment. You know, they they re, they felt that the reason that these guys were talking so strange, it was the fault of the enlightenment. It was all that talk about mind and Berkeley, and it was Kant, and they really said. Metaphysics is the whole problem. We're just going to talk um, not about anything like that. About okay, we're going to talk in regular, ordinary language. Like I see a water bottle over there. That's the water bottle. It's a real water bottle, and I know that. Okay, like anything else, it's kind of nonsense. So this is uh, this is how it began. It wasn't a technical kind of explanation. It just was like, let's talk like ordinary people. And they called it ordinary language philosophy, invented by G.E. Moore. Now, the other thing that they were uh, they didn't like, and it sort of shapes this whole period of philosophy, which has a name, you'll find out. It's called analytic philosophy. Okay? And we are in the period of analytic philosophy. It's a broad uh, sort of like um, family of schools that have things in common, but it, it emphasizes common ordinary language. We don't talk woo-woo, well, like I use that word a lot. So these are their very titles show that they did not like idealism, see? The titles are the refutation of idealism. That was sort of what launched it, 1903, by uh, Moore. They were both at Cambridge, by the way. And I, I, I'm pretty sure, I know that uh, Russell was. Uh, the nature and reality of objects of perception. Okay? They're trying to explain it by just talking normal. 
they felt that would be a possible way. In defense of common sense, so that's a water bottle and that's just common sense and it's physical and I know it's there and that's all there is and that, that seemed to be, it, it, it excited people that they were getting to talk like regular people again. So, and then proof of an external world. And then Russell did his own version um, with a longer title, but in 1914 he wrote, Our Knowledge of the External World. Okay. They couldn't really prove the existence of this external world, but, but they wrote papers with titles like that, which is a common feature. Okay, the new school was called Analytic Philosophy, a family of methods to skirt metaphysics and get away from idealism. It wasn't initially called materialism, but that's what it was. Materialism isn't a positive idea, it is a, it, 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 it is a negative idea. It's not, no talk about mind, but there's no actual positive part. Remember in the Enlightenment, everybody actually gave, a, made an attempt to actually explain things? Um, these people didn't do that. Uh, they, they, uh, really. Although we'll get to some. Now, this is a very funny thing. Um, Moore gave a talk uh, in 1939 at the end of 40 years of teaching philosophy. And he was so frustrated trying to prove, prove of the, uh, the existence of the external world that, um, and this is, um, that he, there was a cla room, classroom and he, and, he got, and he stood there behind the podium, that's kind of a famous thing in philosophy, and he said, this is my proof of the external world. This is my right hand and this is my left hand. Okay. The problem with that is that Moore didn't understand the mind-body problem at all. We have followed it, so we understand that that's not, the, the question isn't can we perceive things or experience things, it's what is their fundamental nature. So it's very naive. It, it's almost like a, uh, I can't even understand the, the regression in the thinking since the Enlightenment by the time these people. Now, it's funny because the same argument had been made in 1791, making fun of Berkeley. He said, I, he took us a rock. I happen to have a rock very much like the picture in there. And he had there's a rock. And he said, I refute Berkeley thus. Okay, so <laughs> that, that's it. I refute it thus. But again, these people don't understand the problem. I've never understood why they don't understand the problem, but it's a common thing. I don't know what, what they're talking about. I, I, other people have pointed this out. Now, to show how serious the problem is about the mind-body problem, the skeptical problem, like we've gone over for a couple of weeks now, is that even if you could shrink yourself down, because you could do a mind think, well, you think it's something about atoms. It's not about atoms. If you could shrink yourself down to the size of an atom and you look at an atom, and recently they say that this is a, a photograph of an atom. I'm not sure. Um, I have the, uh, the source. I read that just like a, during the week. So, so even if you could do that and you looked at the atom and you knocked on the atom and went bonk, bonk, which is sort of silly, but that wouldn't solve the problem because that's not the problem. The problem isn't that we experience. Okay and not proving we can experience objects. That doesn't, that doesn't prove the existence of the external world for us who understand what we're talking about in this room from the... Now, the assumptions of analytic philosophy I'm going to go over. Um, first one is scientism. Because they were rejecting all uh, things of, of metaphysics, metaphysics include... So, scientism is the view... What, what happened is... This is, we're talking the beginning of the 20th century, okay? What happened in the 18th and 19th century, as we all know, is science came up with all these amazing inventions, discovered all these laws, and was, and, and was making things like, um, you know, toaster ovens, and telephones, and uh, literally, and movie screens, and um, science seemed to be almost supernatural, almost like it has supernatural problems. And it was decided that, the, that is the right way, because look at the things that they're able to do. We could never do anything. They felt, they felt um, inferior to science. So they said, though, we should leave all these science uh, problems of like causal problem between um, mind and body. We should leave that to science. Next week, I'll explain why that doesn't actually work. Um, questions of substance, 
uh, causation are abrogated to science. And that's called scientism. That's the only avenue to um, truth, science. So we, now the other next is materialism. They all accept that everything is physical, but they never prove that, and they never even analyze what they meant. Okay. Uh, part of the new thing was to avoid getting yourself trapped where you have to explain what you mean or or um, or prove what you said. You, you, you remember you're just using ordinary language. So everything is physical sounds good. So you just say that that's the the brute idea. They. Um, rejection of metaphysics, as I just said. So talk about God, soul, or even internal uh, states um, is gibberish. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's beneath us. And there was a rejection of epistemology. Rejection, that's why I taught you the word epistemology. Rejection of looking into how we know things. This is a very important feature of analytic philosophy. One of the ways that they're going to get away with a lot is they're going to refuse to examine how they know. And so they would become presumption-based or assumption-based. We have assumptions. We, and then um, Bertrand Russell wrote to express this idea, I propose, therefore, always to begin any argument that I have to make by appealing to data which will be quite ludicrously obvious. Of course, it never was ludicrously obvious to, the other, to several other people. So it's very naive, OK? Um, when you have a taboo against talking about how you know something, obviously it is presumption or opinion based. Uh, basically, it's not really philosophy at all, OK? So they have kind of, this is because, you'll, you'll find out why. OK, continued on um, more features. They deny or, or attempt to ignore or they attempt to deflect by talking about something else, conscious experience. Because conscious experience, as you'll see, is a real bugaboo for them. And so, but that, since they can't explain it, they're going to use, um, you know, um, wishy talk that basically deflect. Try to keep the subject off the problem. So we have students. Uh, for instance, you look very closely at details of, you know, the meaning of a word and language and syntax or something. But when you're in, when somebody has this problem, you you basically deflect away from it to avoid it. Um, next one is concession. Um, the concession of folk psychology. You'll understand that later. I'm going to explain that later. Per pervasive talk of the external world. It's very funny that. These people deny, deny, they deny, remember, their experience of the journey. Okay, they're going to, you, you're gonna see this. They wanna deny this, but they're gonna constantly talk about an external world. So they're talking about an invisible hidden world stuff, which is very bizarre. It doesn't even make sense in, within the construct um, their own constructs. Uh, if you pick up any book in analytic philosophy, on the very first page you'll find the word external world. And it's talking about philosophy of mind or philosophy. The very first, some very first paragraph. Then you'll find it all through every single book. I brought a lot of books here. That show that. All right. Um, there's another thing. Because human minds, you're going to find, don't have intention, because we don't have minds. Um, they, they, they assign intentionality to the words themselves. So literally, the ink has intention, but no person has any intention. That's a very, very strange. It's completely, uh, doesn't make any sense, I say. And they talk about cognitively meaningful sentences. They don't mean people are being cognitive, have it in their head, because they don't have a head. Okay, all right, so now, the first, the first school that I'm going to talk about, I'm skipping some, just briefly, there, there were other schools, but they were thoroughly, um, eh, don't have all my books, they were suddenly uh, abandoned. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to sidetrack that. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were abandoned, so why talk about them? But uh, one that's interesting, that tells us a lot, it's called uh, behaviorism. Now, there's a difference between, uh, behaviorism kind of has a little evolution. The first behaviorists were sort of like Putnam, uh, no, not Putnam, um, like Pavlov, 
Okay? What they wanted to do is just, they felt that it was uh, talking about interstates like Freud did. That's sort of the 1800s, they're abandoning that, that's European. Um, that's just nothing talk. Okay? We want to be scientific in our talking. Uh, Pavlov was a scientist, okay? but, but this became philosophy. We want to ignore anything that we can't describe mathematically, quantify, because we felt that's scientific. But if we talk about the qualities of our experience, like how a headache feels, well, we don't have headaches because that would require our mind. But so, uh, to, so for, to, to be hungry in a Pavlov's dog uh, means it's salivating. The salivating is what we mean by the hunger. Okay, there's not another hunger, it's just the salivating or, or other features that you see from the outside of the dog. Well, initially, or our happiness is this. Okay, a, a behaviorist, I, I, knew, I had a professor who was a behaviorist from Har with his PhD from Harvard University, he was no slouch. He said, if you had a corpse and you pulled its lips up, it would be happy. Okay, that, that, that's how serious they mean it. And he was allowed to teach at Harvard? He, no, he taught with me in Arkansas. Okay. He had his PhD from Harvard. From Harvard. Okay. Um, <laughs> now, the, the, so initially it was just, let's translate all internal talk into external talk. So when we talk about being, um, you know, having a headache, Let's talk about sweating and going like that, and got it? So we'll just translate the language into that. But eventually it became, no, there really aren't headaches. They really, they really don't exist. People just think they have headaches, but they don't. And I have a joke, a uh, behaviorist joke. And my behaviorist joke uh, goes, um, um, am I exposed okay if I stand in the line? Okay, I'll go over here. My behaviorist joke is, um, a woman says to her husband after 30 years of marriage, I made this up. Because I've never told it before. It's kind of a dirty joke. Okay, so they've been married 30 years, and the wife says, you know, honey, I, I had to confess something to you that I, always bothered me. But I've been faking my orgasms for 30 years. And then he says, because he's a behaviorist, he goes, no, you haven't, dear. <laughs> Okay, so they basically go back, they're doing what Descartes did with dogs. Remember that dogs in Descartes uh, don't have a uh, soul. Uh, people, they have the, their mind can, um, can, uh, can, can wiggle this pineal gland, if you uh, were here two classes ago. They can wiggle this, and then that literally made pipes carrying animal spirits, move your animal spirits, which are fluids, then move and pull your arms and such. They put Descartes in front of the horse? <laughs> never, never mind. I'll put him in front of the horse. Does, can you explain? Okay. Um, the, the, so anyway, but, but, a, but, a, but, a, but a dog, uh, he works the same way, uh, but he doesn't have a, a mind or soul. So it just, uh, this all works by itself. And you have input and output, kind of like a machine. And this was being readopted in the 20th century. That's what behaviorism is. It's a return to before the Enlightenment. See, Descartes was the beginning, sort of launched the Enlightenment. He's actually in the Renaissance, uh, some would say, I would say. So this is the kind of structure that uh, a lot of the posit logical positives I uh, believe that reflexes, all behaviors are reflexes produced by a response to a certain stimuli to the environment. This is exactly what Descartes thought. Now, if this were a dog, you would see that the heat literally heated up the, the fluid, which actually then caused the arm to move like this. It's very strange, it's completely automated based on mechanical birds he saw as a child in Paris. Um, so there's nothing new in behavior or something, therefore. Matter of fact, they sort of just replaced, if you remember Thales, many classes ago, like in the sec, uh, first class or second class, Thales believed that what motivated us was magnetism, um, which he saw in magnetic rocks, magnetite. And so basically, they, they just were replacing his fluids with electricity. It, it, in other words, 
this has all been thought before. There's nothing really here, here. Okay, so the next one is linguistic philosophy. It's credited to a person named Wittgenstein, who's considered the greatest philosopher of the 20th century by Time Magazine in their 100 most famous men of the 20th century or people this year. Linguistic philosophy proposes that in wake of science, now we have science and it, it does have everything to do with truth. Okay, that's their business. Um, the only role left for philosophy is analyzing, oh, this is what was eventually adopted because of Wittgenstein. The only role left for philosophy is analyzing word meanings as a form of therapy for people suffering from deep questions. To show them that they don't know what they're talking about, and you literally, it's a trick. It's a deception. You actually get, you keep asking a question, and then you ask another question to to, to ridicule what they just said, and you work them into a confusion until they submit. <laughs> and then they go, you're right, we can't ask deep questions. So this is very, very cruel. It's actually a war on anything deep. So um, this was, Bertrand Russell was very angry at this. He was back there with Moore. He said, what the heck are they doing? He was interested in these deep questions, okay? He, and I like uh, Russell, by the way. Um, but he called this lazy, and, and, and uh, he, it evades all deep questions. And there's a book, and I have it right here. It's a, I wish they had told it to me when I was in school. I had to find it years later. It's called Words and Things. Words and Things by Ernst Gellner with an introduction by Bertrand Russell, where he sca gives a skating review of this school that was trending at Oxford um, in the, uh, I think, 19... Um, um, 40s and 50s. The, the, this book is written in 1959. Okay. The next one's identity theory. Identity theory, these, these are the various attempts to deal with, explain things without a mind. So an identity theory is the notion that the brain states simply are what we mean by subjective experience. So if there's like some supposedly some electrical activity going on when you're having a headache, the headache is that electricity happening. And now, but this began to have problems because they noticed that the brain is very elastic. And you may have read about this because it's been very popularized that if it is not just one set of firings in the brain that causes a headache, that you, it's different in different people and different at different times. And some part can be damaged and it starts appearing somewhere else. So, and they could never correlate internal experience with exact places in everybody's brain. By the way, that, that was never able, they were not able to do that. They found that they have general regions. So this idea that you could actually have a one-to-one -one correlation was even disproved. So they, that first one was renamed, in hindsight, type identity theory. The idea that there are types of activity in the brain that are headaches and all the other experiences, happiness, okay? But there's, there's just token. In each, we can only talk about in this moment, if you, what you think you're happy is whatever brain activity is associated with that at this particular moment but we don't know what it is, and we don't need to tell. We don't need to find out. So it's very, very, very uh, tricky. It's just sort of like whatever is the cause. It's not, they're not looking for the cause. They're, whatever it is, that's what it is. So it's, very, it's, a, it's a tautology. A tautology is, you know, all bachelors are unmarried, <laughs> okay, so like that. I mean, it's, 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 so the thing that it is is the thing that it is. A rose is a rose is a rose, a tautology, something that can't be wrong because it's absolutely meaning. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't have any uh, real content to the sentence. Now, functionalism, this is actually the current view in philosophy. Uh, you run into a philosopher who's teaching at a university and he, his area isn't necessarily 
this, is, this falls under philosophy of mind. If this area is not specifically philosophy of mind, you go, well, what's your philosophy? He, oh, he'll inevitably go, functionalism, because that's what's trending, okay? So you, 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 they don't even know what functionalism is. They, they, they have their scripted words that they learn, learn little definitions. Sounds very good when it comes out and he's, act, and he's a big professor, but I'm gonna tell you what it is, because there's nothing there. Okay, this is functionalism. It was originally called machine functionalism, and it was inspired by thoughts about computers after World War II. They noticed that computers could do things that people used to be able to do. But so could abacuses. Okay, but anyway, then they, they, but they, these could do it automatically because they were electric. Okay? So an abacus, you have to slide it. Whereas these literally sort of acted like little animals. So maybe we were that. Okay, so functionalism turns attention away from explaining how we perceive and toward what people do. It's basically just behaviorism. That's all it is. Um, it is hoped that if all the functions attributed to minds can be explained in physical terms, then what we had been calling mind can be explained away as, ling as a linguistic invention. Since computers can perform many of the functions that minds can, minds can, it stood to reason that the brain was a computer and all talk of mind or subjective inner states of happiness, sadness, uh, longing, okay, they, they were just um, bad language. What you meant was that you were acting like, okay, but it's basically behaviorism, um, was truly about such functions. And it's the idea that we're machines or robots. And so I brought a book, and it's called Kinds of Minds, and it's by um, the very famous functionalist, and the, the one who's in uh, Books a Million, all over Books a Million, Top Shelf. These are old books. These are not new books. They, 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 there's nothing new. There's nothing new. They just keep reprinting this shit. This is called Kinds of Minds by Daniel Dennett. And it's basically that, you know, a thermostat is a kind of mind. Okay, so, and then people who are just robots are just another kind um, of robot. So, and that uh, we are robots made of robots. So, uh, he says that in that book. We are robots, so for instance, atoms are little robots, unconscious robots, and then they come together and they form cells, which are robots, and then they come together by random ordering through Darwinian evolution, they form these big robots. And um, that's where you get your artificial intelligence from, that the, the, the robots are becoming conscious and everything, because that means they look like they're conscious. All right, but these functionalists do not believe that we're conscious. It's very important. They do not believe we're conscious, but they have a way to pretend that they do. I gotta go back. It's called folk psychology. Okay, I, I have to explain it to you because I had mentioned it earlier. But it goes like this. And this has fooled even academics, okay? They fool even academics with this method. It goes like this. While there are no subjective and internal states, that is how regular people talk, folk, okay? So we will make a concession in our writing to talk like we believe that. Uh, uh, so we'll talk about being happy and seeing the feeling wonder at the world, but it's just folk psychology. So they're, they're pretending, well, I'm gonna show you what they're pretending. It's very funny. Or it's very uh, terrifying, if really. It's kind of more terrifying. We're living in a terrifying time. You know that this thinking was used at Guantanamo Bay to be able to torture people. The waterboarding is not torture. And the, way, the way they do it is the oh, torture has to be physically observable on the outside. It has to damage tissue. So if you do anything to the person that you can't see, it's like hit them with a, with a, with a telephone book, uh, or put loud noises, or sleep deprivation, that can't be torture because it can't be observed and quantified. So that's not torture because that doesn't exist. That's true. Those were behavior psychologists uh, and philosophers with PhDs, went to Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay and wrote those white papers. And that's why when you hear we're not torturing, that's what they mean, we're torturing right now. Oh. So, um, and that's why they, they, they played with language and they made torture go away. 
but those people are. I should have something. made them stay there for a while. Oh, thank you, thank you, <laughs> Butch. Well, they will in their next life. Right. They will. Now, the behaviorists have been, it's been said that behaviorists feign anesthesia. Okay? Mm -hmm. They're the people like Pavlov's dog. They, they say they don't have headaches. My dear, no, you have not been faking your orgasms. I would know. I, I saw you acting like, <laughs> so, so they feign anesthesia. Yeah. Okay. Now, functionalists using using folk uh, uh, psychology. So talking like getting down with the dumb people because that's how we talk. They feigning being conscious. They <laughs> pretend to be pretending to be conscious. This is the worst form of sophistry that the world has ever seen. Sophistry means uh, fake arguments that lead you to basic confusion so you can win tactics, strategies, not seeking the truth. It's completely insincere. Can I ask a question? Yes. I'm, I'm feeling blown away, not by what you're teaching, but yeah. how many people are made to feel dumb by people who don't know what they're talking That's about. That's right. And I was made to feel dumb, and I promise you, I felt very, very dumb. And I got out all, all the books. And I tortured myself for two years to understand this. Tortured, because it's painful. It hurts. Like, why are you so mean? Why, why this meanness? And why this deceptiveness? And there, sometimes in the book they make snarky remarks oh, wow. about, I know this will seem like, I forget what it was, like, you know, uh, sadistic, but now, I, you know, they, they literally, I wish I could remember the word they use. Question. Pretending another, to pretend. Another thought. Yes. Baba said that as we're approaching the new age, all the crap would come to the surface. Do you think this is part? I mean, I saw lust, breathe, and anger. I see that increasing. Is this sort of shit also? What this is the underlying the seed of that. This is the accepted, what Functionalism is the accepted current, although, oh, I'm sorry, it, yes. Now I said in an earlier talk, and I don't want to repeat it for time, but philosophy, while the subtlest thing, is the most powerful. Like you, you didn't have the, 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 the communist revolution without Marx. You didn't have uh, the French revolution without Rousseau. So. You, you, the, what we see is the is sort of the expression of the underlying consensual view of the world. The underlying consensual view of the world is not just materialistic as we thought, but it's absolutely psychotic and completely dishonest. And you're being made to shut up by make, by, by by making you um, okay. Do they know they're doing that? Yes, they do. Okay, they do. Uh, Absolutely, they do because they joke about it. Um, no. And uh, maybe some are dumb, they don't. But uh, Dennett does. Dennett is um, he's the one who wrote Kinds of Mind. This book is called Consciousness Explained. Right now, this is a book's a million. It's like 1990. There's nothing new, okay? There's nothing, it's not, go, nothing's going anywhere, okay? This book just talks for that many pages and says nothing at all. And you guess at the, the back, and a guy read it, poor Bob a lover, Tim Garvin, I don't know if you know him, he's a very intelligent man, he said it should have been called, it should have been called ignoring consciousness. <laughs> and then I said when I read the book, I said it should have really been called explaining away consciousness. Okay, because it's just functions. It's, functions. it's, just, uh, it's just behaviorism. That's all it is. They, they, they like to get new names because they get published. Now, um, now, this is the current view of our time. 
functions. If you see, this is an ATM machine. Dan, it loves to talk about ATM machines. We're, we're ATM machines. Well, why are we ATM machines? Because just like an ATM machine, you have input, output. Okay, you put in your debit card, you put in some numbers, that's input, and then you get out your money. So it falls, comes out the bottom. And it has some gears like Descartes, okay, that get input, output. So that is a mind, just as much as yours. Yours is more sophisticated and can do more stuff. But soon computers will be able to do that too. And whatever it is you're calling consciousness, it'll be able to do that too because that's not real anyway. You're just deluded. Matter of fact, the, the view is that, this will sound funny, but you just think you're conscious. You notice the double thing? That's a, that's a double bind, okay? Well, if I'm thinking, I'm, if I'm, ex you know, I don't have to experience. Now, and also the statement, I'm not conscious. Well, how would I know that? Don't I have to look into my experience to determine that? Obviously, it's a lie. But it's just uh, completely hokey. Like, how could an abacus say, I am not conscious? What would it mean? Okay? Like, I have a headache. <laughs> like, no. They literally say, we do not have conscious experience, but we'll talk like you do with... Okay, so it's a program of avoiding the subject of experience while appealing to folk psychology. You're being conditioned to believe in AI, it doesn't exist. There's AI and that computers can do the functions that we can perform. But this idea of conscious robots, which is now all the rave and all these AI movies, like the TV series on HBO now called uh, Westworld, which I actually love because I love all these perverse shows. But <laughs> it's about, you know, the robots are coming to life. Eh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a spin-off from a, from a movie in the 60s. So that's not new. I mean, this stuff's not new. There's nothing new. Remember 2001, it was like uh, 1968. There's nothing new. Okay, so there's a thermostat. That's a mind. Mm -hmm. That's functionalism. How do you know functionalism? Now, there's one more school and then we're done. And a couple of comments, including uh, ones you'll be interested in. Uh, property dualism is a, um, is, they're the last good guys. Okay, they're out there. One of them, the most famous, of the, there's two that are famous, but one of them is, gets a lot of notice. His name Daniel, Dan, I met all these people. I met Daniel Dennett, I met uh, the next one, David Chalmers. David Chalmers, Jamin Chalmers recently did a TED talk, and he talked about trying to explain. We have conscious experience, as if we didn't know. Like he's on, he's on the stage going, like we have orgasms, and head, it's like, are you, it, it sounds funny because the guy's like fighting that we have experience, which is completely crazy making. I mean, it makes you crazy making. That's why you, get, you want to go find those linguistic philosophers that'll finally make you give up and finally just go, yeah, well, there's the water bottle over there. You see? That's where they're trying to get you. Give up. No deep thought. No God. No soul. Nothing. Nothing. So, um, this is the view that's that, uh, that now they're materialists. David Chalmers is a materialist, and the other one is, uh, is Thomas Nagel. Um, Thomas Nagel wrote a, wrote a very famous paper, very influential, called What It Feels Like to Be a Bat. So they, they know there's, that we're experiencing stuff. See, these people don't deny. They're the one people that don't deny it. Get it? But they're materialists, 100%. Like, they don't believe in a mind. Now, let me explain. They believe that that mental events that they admit occur supervene upon physical ones. Now, this is where you get, um, we are all stardust, you know? We're just uh, stardust gathered together into these robots, you know? But they believe that somehow the mechanics of the matter somehow is, is, is causing us to have Consciousness and consciousness is something, sort of like it's a phenomenon, okay? Um, I'm going to explain later that it's not a phenomenon. You're going to find out what consciousness is. If they're wrong. Okay, but they're explaining it like it's like electricity. You know, you, you, you crank a like, Tesla um, um, electric motor, and you're going to get current running out, and then little things are going to move. They think it's like that. 
okay? But they don't know how it does it because the no natural laws are known that can produce consciousness, but this is how they're trying to go about it. And they give, use words the way that they avoid giving any kind of thing. Is they say, well, well, there's two things. First of all, they use the word, they use big words for the relationship between the matter and the consciousness. And that is the word supervenience or give rise to. They both mean the same thing. Let me explain. All that these words mean is that they cause it. Supervene, when, you, when something supervenes on, on something, like you put together a, 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 a you know, electric motor and then, and then the hand flaps, you know, it's supervening on all the parts. But the, so it own, they're saying, the own, as far as the close they can get is saying it's a cause to give you a big word for a cause. Super means just a big word for a cause. Okay. So, um, naive assumption that one day scientists will figure it out. So they're not even trying to figure it out. I'm going to show you something. So, now here's a break. They go literally, I heard David Chalmers in a talk. I've heard him say it twice. In a hundred years, science will figure it out. Like they're giving themselves, obviously, enough time, even people joke about it. He'll be dead. How convenient. <laughs> he'll sell his books and then he'll be dead. So. Uh, he will, he'll never have to live to, why, why can't they do it in 20? Well, he'll be still alive. He's only my age. Okay, so a causal problem. Okay, now because of these guys, they actually did a very good thing, these property dualists, because, because of their efforts, a new causal, a new mind-body problem emerges that was always there, but nobody ever saw it. Okay, and it's the causal. So how do those, how do those things there, this is from property dualism that admits we have experiences. How do those, this is an exaggeration, that's not really how it looks, it just looks like a bunch of mud. But, but uh, <laughs> electricity doesn't actually light up, those, that, that, that's different. Um, in this idealized version, how do those sparks cause your experience? Okay, so that's the causal problem, all right? And you see the cartoon? Yeah. <laughs> the miracle occurs. That's the causal problem right there. And they make their livelihood giving the miracle high sounding names, like Gibbs Riley's do. So they're not saying anything. Again, it's tautologies. Whatever is the cause, it's definitely the thing causing it. <laughs> we, we, we got this wrong because we're really, really smart people and we analyze things very carefully. The causal problem was there in Cartesian substance dualism, Barclays idealism, but was first noticed with them. Now, I just want to read this. Up to the 20th century, people thought with Aristotle, and that requires going back several talks, that, the, that by providence or natural order, the purpose of the mind and its organs was to experience. But in materialism, there is no such order. This is explaining why we suddenly see, it's very much like we suddenly saw in Descartes the, the interaction problem um, that had been hidden because of Aristotle's glibness. We also, without Aristotle, have no, we have to find some kind of mechanics now to explain uh, experience. And they could find none. And so new mind-body problems notice the causal problem. By the way, this is a joke. I mean, it's an example of a mechanics. Um, these were called Rube Goldberg machines, and they were in cartoons in the 1930s. And uh, you know, the guy plays the flute and that does this, and then and then ends up doing a very funny task, like give him a peanut. So they need to find something like that in materialism to explain consciousness, because they can. <laughs> they literally you got to come up with something, and they're not coming up with anything. They're not even trying. And by the way, the, the whole project really, it's just a talk now. Nobody's really trying anything. Okay, so there are three kinds of mind-body problem. I want you to say that there's the skeptical one. We've been going through this for, for all these weeks. This is week six. How do we know there is an external world out there? That's the skeptical problem. Or how do we know our experience is like that world? And that's uh, portrayed in the movie The Matrix. You see that in the movie The Matrix and many other movies. Total Recall, <clears throat> lots of movies. So the next one's interaction, and that's specific to Descartes. Once you have the, the interaction that was um, due when you had um, 
Um, <coughs> you only have a interaction buff. Materialism, you gotta you give them credit for that. They did get get rid of that because they, they talked about Descartes a lot. You had your your your, your experience tree and you had your real tree that you can't see in the, in the theoretical external world, which you infer from your experience. And there was a problem, as I explained a couple talks ago, how can an immaterial thing push or pull upon a, on a physical thing, and likewise, how are you getting a, a physical thing to act upon your immaterial mind? Well, <clears throat> because they got rid of the mind, and they kept the, uh, uh, they don't have an interaction. So that's specific to Descartes. Okay, so, so the, but the third one is the biggest, and that was just discovered in the 20th century. And it's the biggest problem. And I said that in the uh, first or second talk. I said, but this is the big problem. The big problem is how do you have experience? At least it's a big problem in materialism. And that is how do electrical states in the brain become or give rise to, in their words, experience? Of the three, the causal is the most damning for materialism. There's not even a theory how this happens. There is no theory to go with materialism. Materialism is just, there's just the external world. Let's avoid the fact that we can't see, let's not talk. This is like, mm. this is just like close, like as soon as you, external, if you don't have an internal world, What's an external world? They use, like I said, like, what's ex external to? So that's, a, that's, I don't, I mean, for a while I thought I was dumb. And these guys were smart. Um, that's why I said at the start that materialism is a placeholder name for a hope for someday theory. Next week, we'll explain the scientific method and why it cannot help, because remember these were science, they use scientism. The idea of, well, science is the only way to get at truth, so science will one day be able to explain it. And that's not our job. Our job is to be, analyze um, sentences and look at like, uh, syntax and stuff. They're actually in a crisis to know what their job is now that they don't do anything. <laughs> okay, so literally, you, you can read that in the beginning of almost any history of analytic philosophy. It'll talk about, well, what's the role now of philosophy since we don't do any philosophy? All right, now, <clears throat> this has come up. Some, uh, somebody said, well, well, I was waiting for the, the, you to talk about Vedanta, you know, and, and, and like, well, I don't like all this uh, dualism, uh, you know, in the West. But actually, uh, we've already covered uh, monism in this course, just some didn't realize it. Hinduism can't help. Were it able, a Hindu would have solved the mind-body problem. No Hindu has. And there's plenty of them at Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and everywhere and Stanford and there are plenty of them. Maya is not new to the West, okay? It's Plato's cave. Plato's cave is that your, per, your sense perception is an illusion and that the reality is outside the cave and it's the sun and it's a unity. That's why the sun symbolizes that it's one, okay? So we already um, had that. Um, I forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, there was, but it was important, hold on, Maya, I'll explain this more uh, later on in a future talk. I'll come back to this and explain why it, it cannot help. And um, I'll also explain next week wh why science cannot do the things that the scientism people are uh, expecting it. We'll also find out that logic cannot tell us, and uh, we'll explain why. We're going to look at it, uh, logic. So next week's talk is going to be on the topic of epistemology, because we're moving, to, we're not going to go to a place of like, a hocus pocus, uh, uh, well, let's just all be rational and just f feel that we're not going to be doing that. It's always going to be technical, I'm sorry. But we are going to, but, but it does become intuitive. Okay, and uh, let's see if I have any more slides. I think next week we'll explain the scientific method, why it can't help. We already, oh, we already have that. Oh, this is my last slide. Last slide. Neither in idealism nor materialism work. 
We have now shown that denial of either side of Descartes' mind-body dualism fails. What's left? <clears throat> it's the end of it all. In the sense that every avenue has been tried. Denying the object and denying the subject. Idealism, materialism, dualism all fail. It solve the problems that we we're talking about. In sense. There's nothing left to try. And then my, I love the movies, The Lord of the Rings, and this is Frodo at the end when the volcano is blown up and they think they're going to die. <laughs> and he says, I'm glad you're with me, Sam, here at the end of all things. So, Jay Baba. Jay Baba. You know, from listening to you, I understand why. Can you run that so in case she says um, good? When I first read God Speaks, when I first came to Baba, it was like wonderful. He was so clear. There was nothing that made me doubt anything. And I knew partway through reading God Speaks, and I'd just come to the center not knowing about him, that this, I, my search was over. Because all the rest of the time was full of gobbledygook. I agree with you. Yeah. But, but I came at it at a different, in a different way, in that I, my father told me that, God, explain God speaks to me when I was five at my bedside. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I never knew anything else. So, and I never studied anything except art until I was 40 years old. So when I was hearing what other people think, it, it was, it was like the like uh, I was going. I mean, by the way, I I, I could, yeah, it was like what I could answer these things from mm -hmm. from from what Baba had said. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to. That's what we're going to get into. But I wanted to do it this way because well, this is the end of the history of of <laughs> philosophy. We're not there, there's no more history to do. And but I wanted to do this history. It's necessary. Because whether you know it or not, and I think some know, you have gained a certain amount of sophistication in an esoteric area of academics, which is philosophy, which is not well understood. Uh, 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 one or two or three uh, undergraduate classes will not tell you any of these things. Some of these things were told to me privately hmm. by, my, by, by, by professors, privately, hmm. in the office. Okay, the idea that matter is a theoretical entity—that doesn't—that's something you don't say to the undergrads. Um, a lot of these things. Okay, but um, yeah, and the word epistemology—I I introduced the word hypostasis earlier, and I've used it a lot. We're going to continue to use it. We're going to talk a lot about epistemology, and next week is—it's going to be technical again. It's, we're gonna, we're gonna, it'll always be technical, and, but, you, but it'll, it won't be what, what hasn't been um, introduced in the class or that you can't go back and it, it's, not, it's not technical. But I'd actually have to show how logic works and why it can't resolve anything and then exactly how science works and why it cannot resolve anything. And then we would be uh, really, uh, and I, I think that'll take half a class. And then, and then we'll be uh, able to start remodeling a new way of. Th no, it's I, I, funny. The last thing I was going to say, and of course, next week we'll begin on a new way of thinking. But actually, we have a little more. To intuitive? Cover. Hmm? Intuitive thinking? Well, let, let me. Um, okay, I, this course, I, I came up with this, with this course the, the day before the first class. So, and I came up with the title really fast, and it was Baba in the Future. But it, it should have been called Baba for the Future, because the things that I'm going to say are not going to be what people expect me to say. And, and my talk about intuition will not be familiar. Mm -hmm. It's what I think Baba means, mm -hmm. at least in part. And I'm completely open to if somebody doesn't like where I go, I think a lot of people won't. 
the, I, I learned from Jamie Newell. I like his language about the shamanic and the priestly. Mm -hmm. Your own shamanic experience must never be in, interrupted or confused or distracted or sidetracked by priestly kinds of concerns. Things like explaining uh, somebody's opinion on, on Baba or something like that. Your, your, your path is your path no matter how strange it might seem to me. And I want to make that really clear. Uh, and, and in fact, you, we, that I said the very first off, this isn't for us. We're doing Baba just right. It's, it's all heart. And, it's, and, and, Bob, and we approach him our own individual way. That I think in the future, there does need to be a collective new way of seeing the world, which is what we're going to talk about. But I'm not going to be talking about intuition like, like psychic intuition or something like that, or telekinesis or something like that, you know, or you know, psychic healing or, or be, and I'll show why. Doesn't that fall into the realm of ESP? Realm yes, of I would think that. Yes, I, and we're not going to. It's not going. That was my concern that. And that, that's. And that's also intuition. Woo -woo. Yes. Okay. It's because intuition also has more than one meaning, as many words do. And it has a poetic meaning too, and um, and I'm completely comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with all of them. I even believe in mother's intuition. My mom, every hundredth time, she got it damn right. No, no. <laughs> Sometimes it was uncanny, you know. I do. Sometimes I I know Megan's gonna call me, you know. But that's not what we're gonna be talking about. Mm -hmm. But I'll go into that. That, 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 that kind of is the talk after next, or even another, because we have to, because we're starting over, we're going to be, we're going to be looking at things so differently that there has to be a kind of re-examination of everything about how we thought. It's going to be, it's not something that's ever been thought of, ever, and I would know. I really would know, because I have a, because I have a good understanding of Eastern uh, uh, Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, too. And by the way, the, the, the dualism of Hinduism is sort of a different dualism. It's not the one we're talking about. They're not trying to solve these kinds of things like how we experience the world. They're, they're, theirs was about soul and, and God, Atma and, uh, and, and Brahman. Atman is Brahman. But that's not, that's it. That, we're going to this, this series, if I can finish it, and it goes well, will explain Advaita Vedanta. By using Western words, we're going to arrive at the same place. But we're not going to arrive at it like a doctrine, just a doctrine. See, Indian philosophy is not like ours. There's not all this noodling. They just have, they have masters. And they, 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 they just, you, you get, Adi Shankara is called a philosopher. He created Advaita Vedanta which is Atma is Brahma, okay? He created that, it's called non-dualism, or Advaita means not dual. Uh, and where did he get the idea? It's in the Bhagavad Gita. It's in, so it, it's not like he did it through reasoning, really. Mm -hmm. um, he, he interpreted, not just the Gita, what he called Shruti, or the, what he felt were the impeccable Vedas. Uh, and he put other things aside as questionable and secondary. And these were primary, and he felt they were straight from the source. That literally the sound of the Sanskrit is the truth. These are the thoughts. That's not like our thinking. But I believe that through our thinking, because of Baba, we actually can arrive at a place that's incredible. But that's the same place. Um, in a more um, worked out way. Um, because they don't need to work it out. Indians are not intellectual. They're smart, but they're not. This, these kinds of things don't really bother them. They can live with a lot more dreamlike imagery and stuff that we used to be able to, but we've kind of lost it. Um, when I say the future, I kind of picture in in twenty or thirty years these clean, good not on drugs, 17-year-olds that are 
reading my book and looking, and I'm dead, and they're then they're looking at these, and and they're getting excited, and they're Western, and they're probably American, and they're like, this is ex this is different, this is something that could be ours, and I actually and I think that the West can catch up or even surpass the the East in a certain way. Uh, I th it's a funny thing to say, but I think that's why Baba wrote God Speaks in English, and that's why he wrote God Speaks and the Discourses. I don't think they're for Indians in Andhra Pradesh. I think that Baba's books are for the West, that they, we need to now graduate. Uh, but, but we've got to do it our way, because whether we, whether we want to deny it or not, it's my opinion, I can, or I can say this of myself. We have Western thinking. Okay? I have Western thinking. As much as I can appreciate everything Eastern, and Eastern's a broad word, but I can't be Eastern. I can't see it how they can. I, can, I have to see it my way. And I love Barclay. And I, I, I don't love Kant because he was an icky person. Just a quick story about Kant. You know, but I love these people. I love them. I, I like Bertrand Russell. I love Bertrand Russell. He's a, but by the way, Kant, um, he, he, he would think all the time, and, and there was a prison near his house, and he, they would sing songs in the prison in Germany. They would sing. And, but it disturbed his philosophy. So he, he was a, very influential, so he had them stop the singing in the prison. Oh. Oh. And I, as I mean. That's pretty nasty. Yeah. It's like Descartes. I, um, vivisecting his wife's dog. Mm. And they're not sure it's true, but it's a story that's told oh. about the copy. These were nasty. But yeah, I don't like the car. I don't like the car. <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> but, um, but I like what he did. He, he did a, a good thing. OK, so did you video that? Well, I'm really appreciative. I hope you'll use the whole thing, because um, yeah, this you after if if. At the last talk, if their people will show up, I want to discuss the whole thing just like this. No, no talk, no slides. Just us sitting around, maybe mm -hmm. and talking like with with the camera that can get great. us because because the things that you guys uh, say is very uh, the two of you especially. Well, I noticed it last week. I mentioned it. Um, That'd be great. Yeah. So, and, and even criticize it, uh, ask questions, criticize it, um, because I, at this point, I'm, I'm pretty um, excited I, that this is this is what I do, and, and I'm and I'm comfortable now, and I don't have any doubts uh, for myself that that are going to come up. Did you prepare this just for us? Mm -hmm. Are you going to? Well, there's a book. Uh, okay. that I'm following and it, it's a manuscript but my daughter was here and then it was um, frankly I had so much fun with her and her fiance visiting me that after they left after th like three weeks here I couldn't get back to the book it was too lonely it just mm -hmm. was and I had a cold while I was waiting to get over the cold and it just I dreaded having to go back to work on but anyway the book is right now it's a uh, would publish at 400, it's 100,000 words. It would publish as a 400 page book. And I have been following the book. But I, no, I guess what I meant by I prepared, I prepare these PowerPoints each week. But I do them in consultation with my book. Okay. I think we ought to send a link to your talks to all the philosophy departments. Well, wait, let's wait until they're done, make sure that I can succeed. <laughs> but, you know, I could get to the end. And That's a great like, idea. I thought this was gonna make yeah. sense and, oh, I see, I see it doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> I mean, really, it could happen. I, mean, I hope not. So well, you, know who, you know who's in charge. Baba. Of course. Yeah. If Baba wanted, I don't think he'd waste this much resources on just humiliating me again because <laughs> I, that's so much easier to do well, in other ways. Else. You, you never know. Extra. You never know. Knock <laughs> on wood. But up to this point, you've given a really understandable, comprehensive history of how philosophy has dead ended itself. And it's really, yeah, it's I mean, I never would have gotten No, people don't even know what materialism is. 
Yeah. Um, and they think it's, oh, uh, well, all that exists is what we see. Well, actually, that's not materialism, because it's actually that the only thing that exists is the invisible external world that nobody can understand. <laughs> it doesn't even make any sense. But you link them all together. I took philosophy classes. They never tied it together no. to show how it progressed. No. I mean, and they never... Um, it's all disjointed. They, they yeah, they didn't. They didn't do a lot of stuff. No, I, 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 I took them too, and they didn't. And you know, I went my first six months studying philosophy, I was in so much pain. Uh -huh. It was after the six month part. And uh, I was in so much pain, just confused, just so confused, that I was like going to, quietly to different professors and, and admitting my, I mean, the, the, the stress. But then that's just like, a little while later, and suddenly I had this experience. I was like, wait a minute. I get this. I'm good at this. That, that's actually really, really cool. But there was that moment of crisis where I was like, I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so it's hard to get. It's hard to. But now it's all very clear and simple.